connected development and our initiative, our flagship initiative known as Follow the Money Engagement Platform, which meant to equip citizens with the ability to track government expense. We know that public funds have been allocated for public projects across country, constituencies. However, we also know that a general dilemma across the continent is that very rarely are public funds completely used for the benefits of the citizens. I follow the money asking questions, where are the monies going? And we track the government and international aid. So we came up with the um, follow the money model. Now in follow the money model, we have a we have a designated procedure in order to track these expenses. So we have our online advocacy, we have our offline advocacy, we have our ground truthing where we go to the communities and find out what is going on. We look at government tenders, we evaluate uh, public documents using the Freedom of Information Act, and then we ask questions. But beyond the work we do as an organization, we believe that a greater way to scale the work that we do is to equip citizens at the grassroots with the abilities to follow the money themselves, because people are the only true sustainability mechanism that we can institute. As an organization, we only have very, very limited reach. But if citizens have the capacity to do this work themselves, then more people can track companies, more governments will be hold, held accountable, more elected officials will be held accountable. And so for the money is a network of grassroots citizens which is dedicated to tracking government and international aid spending. And when we started Follow the Money um, in 2012, it was all completely offline, you know, where um, having conversations with the media, we were engaging citizens at the grassroots okay. through, through the radios, you know. So, um, can you hear me? I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Perhaps you can switch your video off because um, uh, I think you dropped off for a second and yes, it was just my internet. So I just want you to, to pick up again from the point where you were speaking that um, it's, a, it's about equipping the citizens with the ability to track money and follow it themselves. Okay, yes. So we were equipping citizens to the ability, like you just said, to track government expenditure themselves, right? Because we know that people, citizens are the only true sustainability mechanism that we can institute. Because citizens, we have hundreds of thousands and even millions of people across communities when as an organization, we only have we only have so much reach, you know. Um, and so we equip the citizens, we go into communities, we conduct trainings across all our communities. So far, since 2012, we've reached over 300 communities in Nigeria alone. And we began spreading, you know, in Nigeria, we began seeing the evidence of the impact of the work that we we're doing. Citizens began asking questions themselves. Citizens began utilizing the tools that we equipped them with to ask questions about monies that were allocated to constituency projects. We found this as a, a method that works, right? And so we decided we can scale this across the continent. We can equip other nations with this same capacity. And so from Nigeria, we have upscaled this model, follow the money model to nine other African countries, nine countries. And now beyond offline advocacy, we began looking at a term civic engagement tool, you know, which citizens can use to connect, connect between community. They can engage, have conversations. They can, um, reach out to their elected officials from their communities. They can tag these elected officials. And so we designed a civic engagement tool as I Follow the Money platform. Now the I Follow the Money platform is available on web and mobile apps. So you can download it on both Google Play Store and iOS. Um, just type in I Follow the Money altogether. I follow the money. 
you know, on web, it is ifollowthemoney.org, right? And when once you get there, you are seeing citizens putting up pictures about the works that are, um, of, of incomplete projects that are ongoing in their communities, about abandoned projects that have been left in their communities, about ongoing projects. So citizens are the ones driving this campaign themselves, right? And currently on the application, we have, on, on this platform, we have over 7,000 active members. 7,000 active members and over through the training that we do through our town hall meetings, through our community outreaches across these 10 African countries with our reach, we have been able to impact over 4.8 million lives. It means that through our radio engagement programs, through our community outreaches, through our town hall meetings, through uh, citizen-led activities, over 4 million lives have been directly affected. I'm not even going to speak of the indirect uh, beneficiaries of the work that we do. And we've been able to start over $500 million worth of projects across these 10 African countries. You know? And so these numbers speak to the impact of the work that we do. Now, the screen that you're looking at right now is is just a demo version of our of our platform. Um, and earlier on this year, through um, uh, the African Union and Civic Tech Innovation Fund, we were supported with funds to upscale the work that we do. Now, until date, the project, the the our platform has been mostly for people who speak and read in English language. But through the work that we're doing, through the support from AU and Civic Tech Innovation Fund, we've been able to upscale this platform beyond the shores of Nigeria, but to these nine other African countries in their languages. So we are speaking of Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, Kenya, Cape Verde, and um, Sierra Leone, Malawi, and in each of these locations, we are targeting citizens at the grassroots. So we're upscaling to um, Swahili for Ethiopia, French for um, Northern Africa, Swahili for Eastern Africa, um, and, and uh, Arabic for some parts of Northern Africa, and because we, we further want to reach the people, we further want to this work that we're doing to be to become a household activity so everybody regardless of your educational qualification can track projects can follow the money can hold government officials to account because we are a social accountability organization that pushes for citizens engagement citizen-led tracking with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. I'm, I'm happy to welcome questions or input. Thank you so can you much. Hear me? I can, I can. I think there might just be a delay on my end, but thank you so much for okay. that very <laughs> concise presentation. I think that the work that uh, Connected Development is undertaking is quite a big one. I mean, you're talking about scaling across nine countries. That's nine indigenous languages in which, you know, the platform and the app need to be translated. And I really think that you've given us so much to interrogate and speak and ask more about in the Q&A session. So thank you so much for that first presentation. Now I'm going to bring on and welcome onto stage Ismail. If you are there, please put your camera on. There we are. Um, just a reminder, you have 15 minutes for your presentation and we're going to hand over to you. Thank you. Um, let me just, I'll just share my presentation. Um, please, if you can confirm that you can see it, then I can start. I can see it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak uh, with you about our initiative. My name is Ismail el -Souk. I'm the executive director of SimSim Participation Citoyenne. And SimSim uh, is based in Morocco with a nonprofit organization that started in January 2014. Um, 
And SimSim's mission is to use information and commu communication technology and online engagement to enhance communication dialogue between citizens, public officials, and also support civic participation in every way that's possible while providing assistance to the institutions in responding to citizens' participation. Um, in 2014, we started with, we launched a new book platform, and this platform is simply an online platform that enables citizens to ask questions of their MPs through video and text and to receive responses online and in public. So this is, when we started in 2014, this was the basic idea is that people can go to our platform, uh, they can uh, find their representatives in parliament through an enhanced um search engine and they can they can they can send their questions and then our team connects with mps parliament members i mean um we get the responses and we post them um on the platform so it would look something like this if you go to our platform you'll see that there are exchanges between citizens and parliamentarians as you can see there is the a citizen question in arabic um, at the top and a video of a parliament member who's uh, responding to it um, we um, sometimes give the possibility for citizens to ask um, their questions um, and we let them choose the MPs that they would like to ask the question to and sometimes we direct them to um, the parliament members who would be uh, best I think positioned and suited to uh, provide um, meaningful answers to their questions. Um, so as I was saying, this this was our basic idea in the beginning. Uh, launch the platform, see how the exchange uh, happens online. But at the end of the first year, we realized that a lot of the questions that we receive from citizens um, are not related to the work of parliament members. Is that people sometimes confuse uh, the functions of their municipality or their regional council with the functions of their of their parliament. So there was a lot of work we also um, had to do offline. Um, in um, educating citizens about parliament, um, providing spaces where parliamentarians can meet with citizens and talk about local issues. Um, and we do this offline and online. Um, so basically what we tried to do is that we, we saw that there was an increasing interest in the platform in terms of dialogue and exchange between citizens and parliamentarians. And we wanted to shift this interest to offline events. So for example, as I said, we organized uh, workshops throughout the countries where parliamentarians can meet with their MPs. We noticed that there is not a lot of um, reliable and timely information about parliaments. So we trained and worked with journalists on parliamentary reporting. We organize town hall meetings online and we do a lot of work to basically get um, um, parliamentary information, simplify it and put it out there for citizens to understand and also to um, discuss with their uh, parliamentarians in in, uh, in parliament with the idea that you know when it comes to the time of the elections people can find a website can find platforms where they can go and learn about the performance of their parliamentarians and thus make informed decisions when when voting and one of the things also we did with this interest that was increasing on the platform is that we wanted to do more between civil society and parliament. So we launched another initiative, um, the Nusharik Initiative. And this was basically that we wanted to um, see if civil society can col collaborate with individual parliamentarians and groups of parliamentarians to uh, influence legislation. So basically, um, if a civil society organization, for example, is advocating against um, underage marriage, they come to us, we work with them on their campaign, we turn their demands into um, an amendment of a law proposal, a formal one, and then we um, present it to different groups of parliamentarians in parliament and get them to submit it as their own uh, law initiatives. And under this, uh, for example, we received the uh, Sorry, this is in Arabic, but I think when I talk about the numbers, you'll be able to understand. We received 30 um, campaigns from civil society organizations that either wanted to change something about an existing uh, law or uh, create, advocate for the, for the adoption of new laws. So we received 30 uh, campaigns from civil society and 49 parliamentarians uh, supported these initiatives in parliament. Um, 
uh, the result of these 30 um, campaigns is that uh, we ended up with five final uh, law proposals that parliamentarians then submitted in parliament and then went on through the legislative uh, procedure. We've also had success in working with the parliamentary institution itself. Is uh, in 2019 and the beginning of 2020, we uh, worked with parliament on two levels. Is that um, there are um, accredited journalists at parliament, uh, and parliament invited us and asked if we can help them develop a guide for these journalists on parliamentary reporting. Um, the issue being that. Um, online platform or news platform or newspapers will normally have uh, a journalist in charge of covering the work of parliament, but uh, most of the time these journalists do not receive any uh, uh, training uh, from, uh, from, from the, the newspapers or there is no other place that they can go to for a training. So we worked with parliament to develop a guide that, that can help um, these journalists uh, sort of understand the work of parliament and also um, acquire uh, skills and um, knowledge on how to cover um, the work of parliament. And uh, at the end of the day, our 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 uh, goal at Simsim and Nuabok is to really uh, multiply the sources of simplified, uh, reliable, and timely information that is that is um, available to citizens. And that's why we see journalists being. Um, an ally. And we also um, convinced Parliament to um, uh, enhance its online uh, website. And this was after um, Morocco adopted um, a new um, law on access to information. And uh, so we saw that given that Parliament voted, you know, adopted this, this, uh, this law, it needed to give an example for the other institutions in terms of proactive uh, publication of information and also just providing information to citizens overall. Uh, so we started with their website and what we did is we convinced them that we're going to um, organize focus groups with different users of their platform, um, study their platform basically and submit a report of recommendations, technical and other that would help them enhance their platform, which they did. They received the, the, the report and um, uh, used it to enhance their their uh, their platform, their website, with the with the logic of providing more information uh, on it. So, as we did this with Parliament um, last year, October two thousand and um, twenty one, we had uh, legislative elections in Morocco. So we thought that it was between 2014 and 2021, we've worked mainly in supporting parliamentarians' communication efforts, providing spaces for parliamentarians and citizens to uh, work together, uh, and also supporting the institution itself. So we thought this would be a good time for us to look back at our initiative. Uh, this would be a good time to connect with its users and see what the future of the platform will, it will be. And the support of the IUCTF came exactly on time and allowed us to um, do something that normally organizations do not either do either do not have the time to do or do not have the resources to do. And basically, we wanted to look at our platform, connect with its users, uh, with logic of adapting and upscaling its citizen parliamentary dialogue section, updating the website of uh, with a list of parliamentarians. As I said, there, we had elections, so there's a new group of parliamentarians who joined. Um, we want to embark on a new adventure of monitoring the work of parliament as well. And we want to add um, resources, sections for resources on parliament for the benefit of citizens, journalists, and civil society organizations. We wanted to also make the platform more accessible, user-friendly, um, a lot of people who use our platform use it from their own mobile, so we want them to have a good experience while using it. And we also want to uh, provide our expertise and experience, put it out there for other organizations in other countries or in Morocco if they want to implement it. So basically, we want to create an open source website that other organizations can take and use in their own in their own context. We can; they don't have to consult with us, but. Um, obviously, we would be very um, happy to support any organization that is interested in such a platform 
and um, uh, accompany, accompany them in launching in their, in their countries or even in Morocco on the regional and local levels. So uh, as I said, the, the, the IUCTF has allowed us and given us the opportunity to connect with the, the users. So what we did is basically we uh, did the same thing we did with the platform of, of parliaments. We organized focus groups. We asked people to use the platform live and give us their feedback. And we also put out surveys out there so that we can accumulate, collect all of this feedback from citizens um, and use it to enhance our platform um, and make sure that it's service on the one hand, on the one hand, it serves the purposes that we want it to serve currently, which is provide information to citizens, uh, connect them to their parliament, parliament members, allow civil society organizations to have um, a seat at the, at the discussion table when it comes to legislation and public policy. Uh, but we also want to put it on a new track for future work. Um, so we're at that level now is we have collected feedback We've turned it into uh, technical recommendations that we're actually uh, working on implementing in terms of the development of the platform. Uh, so uh, hopefully, I think in the next two to three weeks, we're going to have our platform online, uh, which is the, the, the new enhanced one. Uh, but that does not mean that our work stopped, is that while we're working on the platform, we we're also continuing our work both offline and, uh, and online. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that might uh, be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ismail, for that insightful presentation. I think one thing that stood out for me was just the evolution of Nua Book into the formation of Nua, Nua Charik, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, just to kind of see that when we as innovators and developers kind of start at one point, the way in which obviously the communities engage with the platforms actually opens up other avenues that teach us what else is still out there that we could do and how we can essentially Absolutely. Absolutely. exactly if I may add, yeah if i may add just one thing in this regard is that i remember when we started in 2014 we sent emails and letters to every parliament member we have 395 in the first chamber right and right. we received only one response oh, from from a parliamentarian who wanted to work with us. And since then we've worked with dozens, you know, everybody who, you know, from different party groups. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, as, as you said, you have to start somewhere. Uh, sometimes I, uh, new ideas kind of are scary to institutions. Um, this idea of collaborating with civil society, they're not used to it. Um, there's a lot of frustration in working with institutions in a sense, but you have to be patient. You have to, I think, understand um, that things, I think, sometimes take time. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just, it's a matter of approach at the end. I think for every civil society organization, um, you have to be consistent. You have to have an approach and be consistent. Yeah. And I think perhaps part of that, and for us not to digress, because we will have a discussion session, but I wanted to just add that part of the resistance is the idea that transparency and accountability is us trying to get them or catch them in the act of something. If anything, a more informed citizenry and electorate helps the entire continent and country, in fact, because if they are able to connect with you, Ismail, who are a member of parliament, that means that the next time you're up for re-election, we know you a little bit better. We understand what your policy is and also what your mandate is going forward. Absolutely. But yes. Let's put a pin in it and we shall circle back because uh, I've been, I don't know if you saw, but I've been taking frantically writing notes. So there's lots to explore. Just a reminder to our attendees on AirMeet as well as on Zoom that the Q&A function is still there for you to post your questions. I have a whole lot of questions, but really the space is also so that we can all engage as a community and a network so that you can also kind of ask direct questions to Pearl and Ismail about the work that they're doing and also perhaps how you see some similarities or how it can be relevant or applicable in your context and in your environment. And now to our final speaker, last but certainly not least, Juanita, are you there? I mentioned this yesterday that we have been um, using Zoom and Teams yes, and on for, um, platforms, but every time we have to keep asking, are the people there? Just to, just to make sure. All right, um, Jonita, you've got 15 minutes and I'm going to hand over to you to start your presentation. Okay, thank you.
just to confirm, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. See this, she's also confirming. <laughs> I can see it, thank you. Okay. Um, so basically, just do something. Okay, uh, I greet you all. I hope we are all fine. My name is Joanita from SEMA. And uh, SEMA, in briefly, is basically SEMA is a Swahili word to mean speak or to say out something. And at SEMA, we make uh, we provide citizens a platform where they can provide uh, feedback on the different services that they've received after visiting a public office, any public office. Um, currently, SEMA is working with the justice law and order sector in Uganda and a few and uh, the health sector also in Uganda. Our mission at, at SEMA is to create a worldwide revolution in the public service uh, that our citizen feedback becomes central to how governments improve service delivery. So we are looking at the aspect of uh, inclusion for citizens to be part of the decision making when it comes to services, to how services are provided by different government entities and offices. Uh, so. We are currently working with over 63 offices in the country under the justice law and order sector. We are working with different city authorities uh, across the country as well, different regions in Kampala, which is the capital city and uh, other districts in the country. Uh, and uh, we are also working with the health sector different health facilities also scattered across the country. In our workings, basically at these offices, we provide a platform using the SEMA tools for people to leave feedback after they've visited a given uh, public office. So I'm going to introduce us to the SEMA feedback tools. The first is a, a, a SEMA device like you see on your screen. This device communicates using five buttons uh, from the happiest face to the saddest face. So basically emojis. So when a client visits an office, these devices are placed at different end stations uh, at the different public offices. So a client is able to press according to how they feel about the services. If you're very sad, you place the saddest face. And if you're very happy, you place the very good button. Um, over time, we have, of course, uh, transitioned from uh, the very first device to the devices that we have currently, which I'll explain later as I go on. But uh, these devices, when a person presses the button, the information goes straight to a SEMA dashboard, and this, this information is able to be interpreted into meaningful data, which is later given back to the office to be able to review their performance. Uh, the next uh, tool that we use, uh, we have a group of trained interviewers or data collectors who are stationed at different partner offices in the field. Our trainees or our interviewers use a survey, a short survey, about three minutes, where they talk to an individual and ask them how they felt about the services and what can be done to improve what they felt wasn't right. And uh, the other remote tools that we have are used USSD code or a toll free line, as you can see on my screen. Um, at the end of every month, we present we present this data into a one-page uh, monthly report, like you can see on the screen. And this page basically highlights departmental performance of a given office, uh, the citizen, the percentage of the the percentage of that month, the performance. It also highlights some comments, the negative and the positive comments, and some recommendations. Uh, it also measures the things like waiting time or did you pay for a service that you were uh, that you when you went to an office where you were, did you pay for a service basically a sort of a bribe these reports are given to the offices every month and we have meetings that we hold to discuss the outcomes of these reports and get the commitment from these offices on how the things that people are not satisfied about can be improved uh, under the AUCTF program, SEMA has been able to uh, tap into new ventures of enabling citizens to provide our feedback, but also improve on some of our old uh, ventures that we had before. Some of the things that we've been working on under the CTF program, we have the QR code, like you can see on the screen, we have a QR code. I will explain later in detail about this. We have a USSD platform. 
we have a semi dashboard and we have a, a trainee handbook. So we start with the QR code. As I explained earlier, in some of our feedback tools, we did not have a QR code, but later we realized that in order for us to get a larger, uh, to, to target a wider audience at the offices that we work with and the elite class, sometimes people don't have time to wait and uh, be interviewed or they, they or especially yeah, to wait and be interviewed. So we came up with an idea of having QR code scanners at the different offices where we work with where someone can be able to just scan using their smartphone. Uh, it's a, it can be camera scanned. And then a survey, a short survey is going to come up and then the person will be able to fill in uh, the information about satisfaction of, of the services that they received in the confines of their car or when they're back at office or when they go back home. Then we are not, well, then we are able to get all this data and we don't miss out on, on those data points of people who are too busy to speak to our interviewers or who have missed looking at the device. So these QR code scanners are customized to each and customized to each and every office. So if it's a health facility, it will have its own QR code scanner customized to that so to that office. And the questions they are under are also going to be customized that office. The purpose of the QR code scanner also was for us to test remote feedback tools. In other words, what are those tools that SEMA can put out there and they work without SEMA being physically present at the office? So then you don't need to recruit trainees or interviewers to visit these offices to test the tools. And then, yeah, so like, like I said, to test them without SEMA physically being present and interviews. The advantage of the QR code scanner is that it gives us more elaborate data. And of course, when it comes to the financial aspect, it is cheap to maintain. However, the disadvantage is that because we work in a large locality, where sometimes we find ourselves in uh, country areas that don't have a good network or people are illiterate, uh, illiterate uh, it means that the audience that doesn't have smartphones is unable to use um, this. However, it, it is helpful in that it's able to target those that we ha that use smartphones. We have done a bit of uh, findings on uh, the technology use in the country, and uh, we at least are able to target at least 80% of the population in terms of, of uh, using this type of feedback tool. Now, before we had a USSD code, but uh, we hadn't, we improved it under the AU CTF program. So this USSD code now currently is also customized to each office. So when you dial uh, the USSD code at a given office, you're able to get the survey for that particular office. While before you would dial the number and it would bring for you a list of offices and then you have to navigate through the offices. But currently the USSD platform is 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 customized to each institution that we are working with which makes uh, it a bit easier for clients to or for the citizens to give in their information because then they do not have to navigate many offices they just give information to the to the particular office the advantage of this tool is that it's an offline method and whether you're literate or illiterate you're able to use it whether you have a smartphone or a feature phone you're able to give in data so this is very very inclusive for us and it has brought for us a number of results especially when we started the trials under the AUCTF program. So you don't need internet and it is very quick and it, it works on in all communities, whether the elite class or the illiterate people. The third venture would be the SEMA dashboard. Uh, this Before we had a dashboard where this is also another improved uh, uh, venture under the AUCTF program. So before we had a SEMA dashboard, but the SEMA dashboard at the time was only targeting the feedback, the, the feedback from the SEMA devices. So under the AUCTF program, we're able to go back into the field and try to understand from our partners that we work with, how would you want to receive this information? Before we used to take these reports every month, like physically to an office, you have to take the reports and explain them. You have to take whatever information you need to portray to, to give to the offices, you have to do it physically, or you have to uh, shed your call on, on Google Hangouts or on Zoom. But under this program, we've been able to improve our dashboard in that when someone uh, logs in, on the dashboard, they are able to see, I don't know whether you, you're able to see clearly my screen, but when you log it into this dashboard, ideally, you're supposed to get all the information 
that pertains your office. So you're able to view a monthly report, you're able to see feedback from the SEMA device, you're able to see reports from the QR code scanners from the and from the USSD platform. So basically this SEMA dashboard was meant to was meant to be given to the our partners, the service providers in the public sector to make it to give them a quick and easy access to to the reports and then uh with this quick and easy access of course it helps them to come up with solutions in real time so they don't have to wait at the end of the month to log in and get information from sema but they can be able to log in as and when at the end of every day at the end of the week they're able to see what people are saying and they're able to give feedback or to work on them at their end in the offices so the beauty about this dashboard is that one, it can also work when SEMA is not physically present at an office, so you don't need to schedule your physical meeting to discuss findings, but you're able to get all the insights from the SEMA dashboard. So this is something that we have also ventured into, and it has really brought positive results. And uh, I can tell it has also taken a lot from the team now in having to visit different offices countrywide to be able to explain some of our feedback that we get from there. And uh, lastly, we have the SEMA trainee handbook. So the SEMA trainee handbook is basically, because we work with interviewers who collect this data in the field, we also figured it would be nice to have uh, a manual that guides these trainees in how to collect data in the field, how to understand some of the things that they do in the field. So that is the traineeship handbook, and we have come up with it. It is complete, and it has it is guiding our curriculum when it comes to having interviewers on board working with SEMA. Our intended impact for these solutions, of course, like I said earlier, they are, we tried them under the ACTF program. We are, we are hoping to take them on because we're already working with them, still trying out a few others, but we are, our intended impact is that we create more remote feedback solutions so that everyone is included in providing feedback when they give visit an office. And also to create offline solutions for citizens who are unable to access the internet or have smartphones. Then they're also included in, in the accountability of the different offices that we work with. And then for public offices, of course, we don't only work with the citizen end, but for the public offices who our target is for them to improve service delivery is that they should also easily access this information from the citizens in real time so that they're able to come up with solutions quickly and easily for the public, which in turn, of course, helps us to improve service delivery. So at the end of the day, citizens have quick and easier ways to give feedback, and the offices also have quick and easier ways to improve the services that they provide. Thank you very much. Ooh, struggling to navigate to my mic there. Thank you so much for that presentation, Juanita. Listen, Sema said, we are done with paper-based surveys. We give you QR code, we give you dashboard, we give you USSD, we give you a platform. Like, it is so insane to think about where we are in terms of collecting information and data to help us improve our services and the provision of certain um, <clears throat> products and how we communicate, I suppose, between um, the, the, the organs of the state, but also with the people. So I think that this is, a, this is quite a revolutionary way of getting that minute data because sometimes you think something as simple as emojis, right, is, is very basic, but actually it's also still a way of collecting information. So the fact that there are interactive aspects to it as well, I think is something I appreciate about the work that SEMA does. So thank you so much for that, Juanita. Now we are going to move right over to our Q&A session and I'd like to invite back onto stage so that we can um, just chat to her again about her innovation, their presentation and the initiative that they are pursuing under the fund. Uh, sometimes I, I like to get a little bit orderly, but like I want to go in the same order as we had the presentations. But if Pearl isn't available, we can just uh, invite yeah, the no, next. Oh, you're there. OK, hi, Pearl. Sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> Um, no worries. So, uh, I if you'd like that... me to turn on my video, you can let me know. Yes, you can actually. I think I think now would be a good time. Um, it's quite possible that earlier I was the one that was having connection issues, and so for that I, I apologize. But um, it's good to have you back on stage. 
I think that what you guys have done is phenomenal. I mean, starting off in one country with just one mission, then being able to scale that across nine countries. And like I was speaking about earlier, just the conversion and the translation of the same product across, you know, nine different native um, languages. Take me through that process. What was that like? How um, was literally redesigning in a way to think about making the platform and the initiative applicable to so many different contexts? And I'm sure you must get that question quite a bit. Yes, so it, it doesn't, it, the entire process is not without its challenges, right? Because there has to be, there has to be an authentication mechanism. Because normally mm -hmm. people would say, I mean, if you want to, if you want people to engage um, on your platform in their native dialects, you might as well Google Translate. <laughs> but the one question I ask is, how accurate is Google Translate with our African languages in particular? Yeah. I know that with, with the more famous languages like French and English and even perhaps Spanish, Google Translate is, is pretty accurate. But yes. I'm sure that you can, you may read um, in Africa, our translations, they're not a direct translation. And so when you, when something is said in one, in one context, Google Translate would not understand that context, but will just give you the direct trans local dialect and the entire meaning is lost in translation right and we're like that is inefficient you know we don't want citizens going online and they're just being frustrated because they're trying to engage you know or just frustrated out of the platform the entire essence of i follow the money is grassroots engagement so the yeah. easier the process flow the better and so we have developers and sit down with our stakeholders across each of these countries, because in each of the nine countries that we work, including Nigeria, making it 10, we have country yeah. lead. And so we sat down with these guys and said, we said, how can we develop country specific language parts? We are similar to what um, Microsoft uses. So when once you are in, 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 in France, you are not just getting we are getting French for France. And I'm sure, I, I am not sure how we apply for the rest of Africa, but I can tell you in Nigeria that even though, yes, we do speak English and English is our official language, we have made English our own language and we have our slangs, you know, in it. So it's not enough for you to just say um, English, all right? It, it's possible for you to filter it down to Nigerian English. Then, the, the average guy on the street, the guy who only understands pigeon, would be able to relate with you oh, no. because you're yeah. speaking to yeah. him in his language using his slang, right? And so we decided, how can we get that same package at, um, in Arabic, uh, Amharic, Swahili, um, right, French, Spanish, Portuguese? How can oh, we no. get that same? No, no, we haven't even yet incorporated Chewa for Zimbabwe, but we are working on it. Okay, okay. I know because we just learned that um, bank apps in Zimbabwe um, are in Chichewa. And we're like, I mean, how did we miss out? It's so on interesting. <laughs> how did we miss out on that during um, our, our um, baseline? Right. However, we started working on like immediately we incorporated it. So even by the end of next month, when we are turning in, when we are launching this platform, we are launching it, including Chichewa. Yes. Including Chichewa. Yeah. So so we, Google Translate is not enough. And then we looked at how to get the specific languages for the zone. And then we developed language parts. It took us a long time to sit down and clean out the processes in each of these languages. Right, I and, just and I think that was the most that was one of the most difficult um, uh, aspects of uh, in this project. You know, the AU yeah. Civic Tech Fund uh, project. But I can tell you for a fact that it's been very satisfactory. You know, I'm very satisfied with the uh, with our outcomes, and I'm so excited about. I was about uh, to say, <laughs> no one can even tell how challenging it was because you're speaking with so much excitement and happiness. So it's fine. You know, we we thank you for all of the work you've been doing, Pearl, because it's clearly paying off. Another question I wanted to say was that 
I really appreciate that in the, in the initiative, it centers the person. So I follow the money, right? And I wanted to actually ask about when people start uploading images about the project statuses or incomplete projects or any discrepancies that they've seen in the expenditure of government funds or just project-based funding, was that what is the, what's the, the, the feedback loop and turnaround response time? Because quite honestly, it's one thing to kind of attempt to raise an issue, but I wonder if part of I follow the money does any work to kind of ensure that when a concern has been raised, there is someone that can take it up? Absolutely. So we have several methods. Before we came online and developed this platform, um, this civic tech platform, our, all our focuses were done offline. You know, so we're using the radio, we're using um, legislation. You know, uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with the Freedom of Information Act. You know, a lot of countries have, have adopted that act, meaning that when once we find out a discrepancy or, or that um, uh, a discrepancy in a project or that we, we feel we've got information that uh, public funds have been siphoned or not being used to do the work that they're supposed to do, we write to the government agency um, involved. You know, we write to the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Agriculture or Finance and ask them to give us the details because it's, it's not enough for us to he have hearsay. We don't just want yeah. to pick up things from newspapers. We want hard facts. And you possess it. You gave up this contract to these um, contractors, right? You possess the information. So give us a hard fact. And because of the Freedom of Information Act, ministries are compelled to respond to those letters in um, in seven days. And so in seven days, a lot of these ministries reach back to us, giving us this information um, mm. or redirecting us to the necessary agency that can provide us with this information. And when, when once we have that, we have the contractor's details, we have a um, list of the work, the amount of money that was created for such projects. Mm. And then, I mean, we go forward with this information, we call out the contractors, what did you do with the money? And I, well, I mean, come on, we're in Africa. When once we're talking, you're calling names, you're pulling out um, uh, facts. People are concerned for the next election. So people mm. ask the world to respond. They are bound yeah. to respond. Even if a lot, not, some of the time, their response may not be completely accurate, but they are bound to respond. They're compelled to respond they have to, to you just to say fakes. You know, and so in number of a lot of the we have recorded that projects have kickstarted severally across um, across uh, uh, Nigeria. Several constituency projects um, have been recorded in their own where access to public information, mm. mostly public information, is a and recently we recorded a, uh, a, a success partnership with a government agent in Cameroon with some of the money. These are um, outcomes that we're getting you know and they are very tangible schools are abandoned, have been abandoned for years get kickstarted hospitals that have been abandoned for years get uh, in places where we turn out contractors for um for me uh, or truly or not spending the money in the in the designated area these contractors respond government agencies respond in order to save face so we've seen an efficiency the work in our te technique and in the model that we utilize and so behold I follow the money platform. Yes I was I was actually going to say that in South Africa our act is called the promotion of access to information act so there is also a similar um, legal um, responsibility that once that act is invoked that you know members of parliament or the the direct um, divisions and departments actually have to give that that further information. Okay, one last okay. question, Paul, and then we're going to move on to the to the next speakers. But um, I wanted to say that what I'm realizing is that so there was quite a lengthy process, obviously, to customize and translate and make sure that the information is accessible through the different nine countries that you scaled to. But I was interested in finding out if those community engagement meetings is something that is also a feature in those nine countries. 
um, and whether or not actually sometimes you invite some of these subcontractors to actually come into those meetings and kind of speak directly with the with the citizens. Yes, so uh, the follow the money process has, is an authenticated model, you know, so we have our ground truth, our, we start from data mining, where we find out what is going on in this sector, you know, and then we have our ground truthing, we're sourcing for, uh, for hard facts, getting documents from relevant agencies, and then we have our uh, offline advocacy, we're going on, on radio, you know, to, um, speak about the findings that we have gotten. Then we have our community outreaches, you know, where we go into the community to speak with members of the community to find out. I mean, beyond what we're seeing on social media, beyond what the media is projecting, what is actually going on in the community? Is there access to these public, um, public uh, uh, institutions or uh, public uh, hospitals or public schools? What is access? You know, we speak with the community members, and after community outreaches, we engage on the town hall level. Okay. So, okay. at town hall meeting, we are calling community members, we are calling the representatives from the ministries, in the relevant ministries. We are calling members of the media. You know, because we don't just want it to be a localized approach. You know, where it's just hot hot. We want them to know no. the media to yes. project this this finding, and, you know, and at that point of town hall meeting, that is where all the relevant stakeholders sit okay. down together to discuss and try to push the work. Okay, Pro, I'm going to release you or else you and I will sit here and chat the whole, <laughs> the, <laughs> the whole session away. I'd like to invite Ismail um, up on stage and thank you so much for your input, Pro. Um, you guys actually, obviously, in this cohort of this deep dive are all working in similar um, spaces and so what I wanted to start off with was that for your initiative Ismail I think that the video conferencing or the video element is such a game changer right so we've seen iterations of people being able to communicate with members of parliament via leaving comments but there's always something that kind of happens when you can see someone's face it's almost like if we were having this conversation and you can see my responses like it, it definitely would change the dynamic. And so I wonder um, what, like what, what prompted that idea to actually have the MPs sit down and record themselves as they respond to questions. I saw in your presentation, you had an example where there was a comment and then the presentation um, at the bottom. And also who sets that up? So is it you guys at SimSim that take a videographer or a phone to the, to the MPs, like what, what's the operations of how you actually manage to, to take it from just a comment and then a video response? Yeah, well, thank you. That's, that's a good question. Um, so I think when we first started, I remember uh, there, it was only an exchange in text. So people will have to go fill out the form, send a question. And it also, you know, shows you which, Parliament member, they want to ask a certain question. And then we just send it by email. We follow up with the parliament member. They send us texts and we put it on the platform. But then, as I said, it took us, I think we realized by the end of the first year that maybe we were a bit, you know, ahead of things. So we had to, you know, go learn from that first year and fix certain things. And one of them is, well, not everybody can actually you know, the, not everybody is educated. So yeah. we want to give them the possibility that, you know, if they don't know how to write, they can they can record a video and send it and send it to us. Um, they can use their phone, they can use WhatsApp and they can send it to us. And then we uh, put it on the platform and then we send it to parliament members or we send them, um, you know, the what it says and the answer, that they answer it. For parliamentarians, we do two things. Some of them, um opt for recording their own videos and they send them to us okay. and some of them ask us if we can assist them in doing it so what we do is we just uh we do one day in parliament where we meet with all the parliamentarians who have to respond to to a certain question so we just go and see them there's somebody you know there's a camera there so they just sit and mm -hmm. respond to a question and then we take care of the editing and everything uh and this was actually good for us in both 
sites, you know, whether they send a video, that's good because we want them to adapt this tool and use it, you know, even on their social media, for example, they can post things to be used on everything. But it also provides us with access to parliament. Um, so when we have meetings in parliament, that's, that means that our team is there more often, is meeting with more parliamentarians more often, and mm -hmm. we can understand what's going on, what's happening, what's next, because unfortunately not all the information is always released. And there are things you need to talk to people, understand like what, what is going to happen. Um, so the culture I think is still changing, but the flow of information is not yet ideal. So for us, our presence in the institution itself is good. Um, and this speaks to something we've been advocating for is we need these meetings to access parliament because and in the last, I think, five years, we've been advocating and talking to Parliament about uh, setting up a framework for partnerships with civil society because they do not have one. So if you are a journalist, you can go to Parliament, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. If you are a parliamentarian, of course. If you have a meeting with a parliamentarian, you can go. But if you show up as a civil society organization, it doesn't work. So we've been trying to advocate for... Um, a framework that's clear, that eases access of civil society organizations to parliament. Um, and we hope that uh, we, they've been working uh, recently on updating their internal bylaws. And that's, okay. you know, we seize every opportunity to send them a mirror and then talk to them and say that you need, you need to do something about civil society, especially that now Morocco has joined the open government partnership and parliament Oh, yes. uh, sets up its own uh, openness plan. So we cannot imagine an openness plan that does not involve the voice of civil society um, and that at least provides access to parliament for civil society organizations. No, definitely. And I mean, at the heart of the work of the OGP, it is about building better service delivery by leveraging the relationship between government and civil society. I definitely think that the visibility also works in your case or in your favor in the sense that for any new MPs that aren't familiar with the with the you know platform, then they can find out, oh, what's going on here? How do I also become? Because essentially it's 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 socialization. As soon as we see other people doing something, we actually oh, also absolutely. want to do it. Yeah. And in this case, it's actually good. It's transparency and it's accountability. So Absolutely. yeah, we want more people participating. Yeah. So on this sense, I mean, we've had um, for us to activate an, an account for a parliamentarian on our platform. We need to receive yeah. their 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 confirmation, right? So they yes. can do it either through calling us, but they also have a button on the website that takes them to our emails. And some of them, because they've seen other parliamentarians work with us. They will go to the platform and ask from the platform to activate their accounts, which is, yeah. which is yeah. It's just as good, especially when they also possibly share those videos on social media. So my next question was around something you spoke about as well. So this idea that when you launch the initiative or the platform, you realize that people actually don't understand what the different levels and the functions of the state and parliament are. And so you almost had to go on an education campaign to just first make this distinction. Now, my question comes from the other side, which is, have you thought about or has the organization considered actually broadening the scope of the platform to also now include local leaders? Because in my head, it does make sense that I feel like a member of parliament is further um, than my local councilman. So if I actually need a pothole fixed in my road, I'm not going to go and look for the MP of transport. I'm maybe just going to seek out um, a response and an interaction with my local leader. So, yeah, just take talk me through the, the, the decision to either broaden the scope and include local, um, local members of parliament or to exclude them and instead redirect those concerns elsewhere. Absolutely. It's this we we've, we've always, you know, it's an ongoing, it's it's always been a discussion for us, is that. From experience, we know that people are more interested in their local affairs mm -hmm. um, and something needs to be done in that regard. Um, our approach was a bit different is that we don't, as an organization, we don't want to do everything. But okay. what we want is that we want to inspire other organizations and work with them so that they can do it on the local level themselves. Like if we have a local organization, we want them to adapt this and do it locally and we can support them. Because I don't think 
honestly, and we have to be realistic, like for an organization like Shemshim at this level now, it would be, you know, impressive if we say we want, you know, to do it on the local level everywhere, but it's not, it's just not possible. We're talking about, you know, 12 regions, we're talking about 1,700 uh, municipalities. So we're, we're doing two things is we're trying to get organizations to, to, to do it locally with our support. And the second thing we're doing is we're launching, uh, we're planning on launching a pilot project with one uh, municipality in the city of Rabat and one rural uh, city. Is that because we realized if we want these organizations to take it and do it on a local level, they need to see an example. They need to have the tool. Um, so our plan next is to launch it in two uh, municipalities, one rural and one uh, sort of urban, um, and, and see how it takes off and try to get other local organizations to do it. And we were very honest when we talked to them is that we, as an organization, we do not have the means. It's not, you know, it's not something that we can all do as an organization. It's feasible at this moment, but I think what I appreciate about SimSim, first of all, is the work on the open source website, because that's one of the ways in which, right, all of these local municipalities can tap into the same um, framework of how to set up a platform, uh, much like the ones you guys have. And then secondly, I then, speaking about now, the platform is that, now your work has evolved in so many ways, right? And I realized that you guys are even helping Parliament reset up their own website. And I was interested in whether or not there actually is funding or resources that have been given to you guys, because you can't have it both ways. You can't not want civil society in Parliament, but you still realize that you need the help and the knowledge and you know the grassroots organizing that um, civil society has. So what was that relationship like and and have you received more support or has has the rationale been that because the work that we're doing is still in line with the mission of uh, SimSim and uh, Nua book that it is still part of the you know the services um yeah absolutely as, and, and, and as I said earlier um it's a matter of approach and when I said this, I really meant that, you know, an organization, there needs to be consciousness within an organization of how, what's its mission and how does it plan, you know, to achieve its mission. Uh, and we also, as we have consciousness in organizations, we have risk, like social responsibilities, we have responsibilities towards citizens, we have to risk responsibilities towards values, and through concepts we believe in. And one of them is democracy. Everybody wants a democratic society to live in, right? So when we talk about parliament, for example, in the case of Noah book, we cannot imagine a democracy where parliament, when you don't, you don't have a strong parliament yeah. um, in the country. And we know that I think more and more there is distrust in institutions. Um, I'll give you an example. When we were working with parliamentarians, one of the one of the reasons we we trained parliamentarians and we worked on a guide for journal sorry for journalists. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the reasons we worked with journalists is that we noticed that if there is something negative coming outside of parliament, everybody knows about it. Yeah. If there is something positive or a law that people need to know about because it influences their daily life, they don't know about it. Because so when we came to work with Parliament, we're like, there are two ways we can do this. It's either we can tell people, you know, like look into the not so good side of Parliament and tell people, you know, this number of parliamentarians do not come to Parliament. This parliamentarian didn't vote. This one did this and this and this. And all what we will be doing is to confirm what their, you know, the ideas they already have about the institution. So how are we helping? Yeah, but yeah. what we can do on the other side is we can go look for good examples in parliament and tell people, you know, it's all a matter of what who we select to represent us in parliament because here are some good examples uh, yes. from parliament and here's why the work of parliament influences your life and you need to pay attention to it so that you make informed decisions when you vote for people. Um, so it's, as I said, it's a consciousness, but it's also a responsibility that instead of just contributing to a deteriorating relationship between an important institution and citizens, we want to show the good side 
and tell people that what we want to do is give more support space for this good side. Yeah. And it's everybody's responsibility. At the end of the day, I'd say, and in Morocco, and I think in other contexts, it's a matter also of political will. Yeah. If there is political will within uh, institutions or within the country, initiatives like these can take off. And you really have to, uh, as an organization, navigate your context. Uh, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of frustration. You want things to move at a faster pace. Institutions have their own logic. Uh, at the same time, you're a civil society organization. You're trying to collaborate with parliament. So you don't want to lose your civil society side. You know, so it's really a lot. It's it's so many things to sort of be, be aware of and, and sort of juggle. It's yeah. an approach at the end. You really need to define your approach. You really need to define your values and be consistent, as I said. I definitely think that the big theme that's coming out of all of three presentations is this idea of collaboration, that when we work together, we are stronger than when we are alone. And traditionally, civil society and government and all government institutions are not usually pairs that are seen to go together. But like you're saying, we can actually redefine that strategy. We can redefine that approach. And I think it's so beautiful when it does work because then it allows that model to possibly flourish and be inherited in other places. So thank you so much, Ismail. Um, thank I'm you very much. Of our time. So I want to invite Juanita back onto our virtual stage so that we can also discuss a little bit more about SEMA. I hope uh, everybody is still with me. I'm still here. All my speakers are still here. We're having fantastic conversations. And, and, and I hope you're really enjoying learning and diving deep, I uh -huh, see what I did there, diving deep about the initiatives and the work that they do. Okay, Juanita, so I have been thinking, since you started presenting and you were talking about the different platforms, I'm sitting here and I'm just like, this sounds like a lot of information. It sounds like a lot of data that is being, <laughs> that is being recorded and stored daily. And the question is really just kind of like, I think to some extent, I understand that the dashboard serves as one of the places where that information comes into. But before it was redeveloped as part of the AUCTF fund, where and how was SEMA storing all of its different survey and response data and how was it being managed? I think that's a big thing in civic tech is that how you store and manage your data actually can make or break your initiative and organization. So tell us a bit more about that. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, yes, before the CTF actually program, we were basically using a lot of Excel. So we, yes, so we have a lot of data points going to our Excel and then we have the data team analyzing this data and then making the monthly reports that we've been taking physically to the offices. Yes. So when the AUCTF program came in, of course, we came up with the idea of developing the dashboard so okay. that all this information is uh, stored in one place. And then we do not have, we are saving the trees, so we don't have to keep printing paper, taking to the offices. And it's very easy for a public officer to log on to the dashboard, which is access. the same for a yes and access it. So you're able to access the reports, you're able to access the feedback data, device data. Yes, and all that. So it's a bit easier and it works in our favor. We are also, we came up with these ventures also, of course, stemming from the pandemic that we had as a, as the world, where we were unable to physically go to offices, where we were unable to physically interview people. So mm -hmm. we were coming also from that line of thought that in case of, God forbid, anything like this ever happens again, or how does how do, does SEMA continue its work? How do we continue to support citizens to give feedback? And how do we continue to support the offices to be able to receive this feedback as well? And of course, the other challenge that the other, other line of thought we had in mind was, we do not have to wait for 30 days or more than 30 days to take a report to an office. This, these people are able to get this information on time. And secondly, it also, the, for example, for the dashboard part, it, it's good for storage because then it means that even 12 months later, an officer is able to view what report happened in January and they're able to fall back. So sometimes, of course, changes when it comes to changes at these offices, 
they're guided by policies, by budget constraints. So you find maybe there is something they were unable to solve 12 months back, but they can look back on it in, the, in case maybe a new financial year has started, then they're able to work on that issue. So that's the beauty about most of the ventures. We were coming from a world where we wanted to stop a lot of physical, physical presence. Yes. Not that we don't want to physically be at the offices, but in the event that we can note, what remedies do we have available? Hence these tools. Yes. Yeah. So I also had, um, this is maybe a two part question. The first of it is whether or not when SEMA was envisioned, had a target market of who it was trying to um, reach with the interactive emojis, right? So the, the actual uh, device that is at each office because now I'm realizing that there are lots of different people that walk into a public office there for different reasons. And um, can, you know, in my head, I think about things very literally sometimes. So I'm thinking about school tours, you know, that come in. We're thinking about tourists, but we're also thinking about maybe members of parliaments and officials that have to engage. And at the time when we only had one means of um, interacting or receiving feedback. Now I understand it's all opened up. Has language been a part of that expansion of the scope? So you've gone from one device to a QR code, to a USSD, to a dashboard and to the physical thing, but also is it available and inclusive for people beyond just English? Yes, so actually all our feedback tools have translations in the local languages. So we have some famous languages that are, are generally understood by all within the country. Uh, maybe something I also didn't mention is that we how have- many, uh, Sorry to interrupt, have, how many official languages do you have in Uganda? The official language is English, but people very and very much understand Luganda and Swahili. Uh, yeah, okay. so, so we are able to translate in those languages and then we're able to target larger audiences. One thing I didn't mention is that we also have in Nairobi, uh, we, we tried, we tested this also with uh, the Nairobi County offices as part okay. of also the CTF program. Yes. So it's not just in, in Uganda, it's also that side. Uh, and in our bid to, of course, to keep expanding to the whole of East Africa and probably out of East Africa at one point. And when it comes to target market, especially for devices, when we talk about, of course, inclusion, devices were, can communicate to about anyone, but we were largely looking at one, people who are unable to also read and write, or someone that is deaf, they can be able to just press a button and also leave their feedback. You know, so as uh, someone that is blind, they are made in such a way that you're able to feel the, those features for, for the, yes. Yeah. So, yes, so we are able to, we wanted to just make sure that we include almost all audiences in making sure that they give feedback. So a feedback device ideally would just communicate to a person who, the elite person, or an MP knows how to read and write, uh, tourists know how to read. We have one device at the airport and we always get, a not one device, uh, like three, but we always okay. get a lot of feedback from them, yes. But mm -hmm. all our methods are made to make sure that each and every person, if you don't interact with the QR code, at least you will interact with the USSD. If you don't interact with the USSD, at least you will meet the device. If you don't meet yeah. the device, at least you will meet an interviewer. So in one more or another, you're able to at least give your feedback at whatever point you're at, yes. Then I also wanted to understand, now apart from the monthly reports that um, you guys write up, what else do you do with all of this cumulative cumulative data that you are essentially collecting that spans years back. Um, have you found another avenue in which to use that or to branch into? Because it's one thing to obviously get the responses, get the feedback, analyze it, and then send it back to the service provider or to the public office. But what about all the other information? What does it mean when we sit and we track the rate of feedback, we track whether a specific institution or public office has been doing better or doing worse? Okay. Uh, 
The first thing that I'm going to mention in answering that is that, of course, when you're carrying out certain researches, you have some questions that you want answered. But of course, mm -hmm. those surveys will always come in with extra information that you're talking about. So the first qu questions that we answer, of course, are the monthly reports, which we get that information. Other than that, we have these offices also being interested in more information apart from that that is in the survey data. For example, how does a delay at a health facility, for example, affect the economic, uh, the economic setup of people around that area? Say, for example, a mother, a mother who owns a kiosk or a shop, a small mm -hmm. retail shop in the neighborhood, spend, says, let me take an hour and go to the health facility for a, maybe an antenatal visit or anything. And then instead of an hour, this person spends almost five hours in this place. So it means that they're losing financially at their retail shop while trying to get a service this side. So this is information that we later through our stakeholder meetings, we also make trend reports that we later give back to not only the first the offices that we are working with, but other different government partners to to make them see how some of these things not only affect the service delivery as in at the office, but other aspects of life of these people. There are mm. mothers who are going to maybe someone has visited, a, not a mother only, maybe you visited a police station, you're trying to get a service, but you've left kids at home unattended too. So it can also affect, or, or you went and spent a lot of time and you come back home and the husband beats you up. You know, that is domestic violence, you know, you where did, where were you? So, but what I can say is that this is, this is what we've, we've been doing it basically for partners that we work with. But again, if there was a continuation, of course, of like the CTF program, these are things we would want to venture in to try and yeah. see how does this data affect, for example, gender, you know, gender inclusion and all that stuff. How uh, men and women are carrying services, how uh, uh, our, how is the is it affecting LGBT community, you know, in, in all those aspects. So we want to explore all those because we have, like you said, quite a large amount of data and it just yeah. depends how you how you decipher it how you analyze it will give you all the answers that you want but of course right now the major questions that we answer are improving service delivery but we would really really want to venture into making this data work in other aspects like i've explained yes and i think that's a beautiful note to end off on uh, juanita because i'm also realizing that with all three initiatives that have spoken here today this is only just the beginning. This is just actually the start of the work that you all are doing respectively. There's still so much more that can be done with the work that you're doing, with the information, with the questioning, um, with the knowledge building, the education. It's just phenomenal. And uh, I think as an African, I just feel so represented sitting here and listening to all of you guys speak about these innovations. Civic textually has to be the future. <laughs> of the African continent. And with that, uh, folks, I'd like to really, really thank you for making the time to be here. I'd like to thank our guest speakers, uh, who are, again, the recipients of the African Union Civic Tech uh, Fund, for sharing with us the important work that they're doing in their respective communities. If you do want to get a hold of them, I'm sure you can see some of their um, details on social media, but they'll, you know, we will be sharing this conversation um, you know, post the conference just so that people who are not in the session can also benefit from some of these insightful um, from some of these insightful shares. I just want to check if my tech support is here because we might have some closing slides to share with you. Um, just to remember that today is our last day of our virtual program, and if you can, please do join us for the last couple of sessions that are scheduled for today. Next up, you can join us at 2 p.m. CAT time for a book talk that's around shifting our relationship with technology. Uh, and I think later on, we also have a session with the MIT and community-focused tech entrepreneurship, which starts at 4 p.m. CAT time. Both these sections promise to be very interactive, to be informative and insightful. So if you have a moment in your day, please do join us. They will be hosted on EMIT. Thank you so much once again to the attendees, to the guest speakers, and thank you for letting me be your host and facilitator for all these daily deep dives. That from me is it. We will now leave out with some beautiful songs from Melo Mino.
Nice.